Welcome to the MD's Fantasy Football Show. Now for your host, Dan Mater. And welcome, welcome, welcome back to the MD's Fantasy Football Show. As always, I'm your host, Dan Mater. So excited to be here with you guys again tonight. We are continuing the coaching mini series. Coaching Changes Fantasy Impact Part 3 tonight. We are going over the Browns, the Lions, the Falcons, and the Dallas Cowboys in today's show. But before we get into all of that, we have a couple of announcements that we have to make here on the podcast before we start the show. Some great ones, some exciting ones. Now, if you've been following me on Twitter or on Facebook at MDFF Show for both, you might already know about this first one. But if you are not following me there, A, you should, and you should turn your notifications on for that as well so you get all the player update information and also know when new episodes drop. But you also need to know now, here on the podcast, now that I'm talking to you, the MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to now be a partner of the Unwrapped Sports Network. This is a great opportunity for the show. I'm so happy to be able to get the opportunity to be able to partner up with a up and coming growing sports blog that they are they're able to they are culminating lots of talent over there they have a great blog great staff of writers that have been writing up all sports all the time great place to go great reads to be able to find and they also have a ton of podcasts like this one for all different kinds of sports and general news not just fantasy football stuff so make sure you go to unwrap sports network Dot com where you can get all of that information. You can find this show on their podcast page. You can go check out their blogs. It's all very much worth it. Up and coming sports network that I am very, very excited to be a part of. To be to just throw in some clarification real quick for some of you out there. I know this might ca- cause some confusion. The MD Sandy Football Show is still a member of the Overtime Heroics.com. And on that note, for the first time ever, This show is going to be going live on the OvertimeHeroics.com website. So make sure, after you listen to this podcast, make sure you are following me on Twitter and on Facebook at MDFF Show because I am going to announce when exactly we will be going live. And it's going to be sooner rather than later. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So make sure you're following me on Twitter, on Facebook. I will make the announcement exactly what day, what time we will be going live. It will be the Coaching Changes Fantasy Impact Part Four that we will be going live on, ending and capping off the mini series. You'll be able to go to overtimeheroics.com. You will be able to listen online as you're on the website. You can go on the forums while you're on there. You'll be able to message me while you're on there. I will try to answer some questions during the show as well if I get some good, compelling ones. So make sure you go on there. You can follow along, check out all the forums, all the writing, all the content that they have going on as well as they have been pumping out articles left and right covering everything from the NBA draft to baseball to the upcoming fantasy football season. There's been a lot of great things going on there as well. So make sure you are following along on Twitter and on Facebook for me at MDFF show because I will make that announcement a little bit later in the week exactly as to when that is going to be and keep in mind like I said it's going to be sooner rather than later so that is what's going on with the show right now a lot of great exciting stuff I hope you guys can all join me and follow the show along and hope you enjoy everything we're able to throw back at you because all of these new resources all this new accessibility is just going to keep improving the show and making it better more entertaining more informative for you this is all for you to give you the best chance to win a championship that is what this show is for that is what my main goal is is i want everyone listening to the show to be there at the very end of the season in their fantasy leagues that is why i am here that is why you should do what i tell you to do and follow along at any time i tell you so okay Make sure Dan knows best. Just tell yourselves that in your mind and your fantasy football season 
will be fine. Okay, that was a queer little rhyme, but you get where I'm going with this. So let's skip right past that, and let's get into the latest news segment. No, I gotta get I gotta get a drop for this latest news segment here. It's it's still preseason. Cut me a little bit of slack. We're still in early summer. I'm still getting some things together. Like there's been a lot going on. I'm giving you a lot. Okay, we're gonna get a latest news segment in here. And on top of it, there's not a lot of latest news to talk about right now. Mini camps are over. It's going to be a hiatus until we are getting back to guys coming back for practice, getting back into training camp. So there's not going to be a lot going on other than kind of recapping and getting back on track as to who looked good during mini camps and OTAs, who maybe doesn't look so good, you know, who's on the roster bubble, who might be making a bigger impact than we originally thought. It's very, very early on. Of course, we're going to get more details when we get into training camp, but this is the type of latest news that I'm probably going to be giving you over the next few episodes. Stuff like this, stuff like uh, Dan Quinn coming out and saying the other day that Devontae Freeman looked very, very good during mini camp. He looks like he's back to his old self. Now, uh, he doesn't. He kind of fails to elaborate on that, but you kind of get the gist of what it is that he is saying. Devontae Freeman not only was banged up a year ago, but he had looked like he had lost a step when he was out there. From all we can tell from all the reports coming out of the Atlanta Falcons camp, it looks like Freeman is back to being his old self in the sense of he looks like he has that pep in his step back, that speed that he needs to break through the line of scrimmage. Now, granted, this is just they're in shorts and a t-shirt and a helmet and nothing more right now, but the biggest thing for Freeman was that first burst when he gets handed off the ball, and from all accounts, he is looking pretty good, and we're going to talk about the Falcons a little bit later in this show. Theo Riddick is on the roster bubble. Hallelujah. It's a miracle. Theo Riddick, there may be a chance that he does not make the Detroit Lions roster. If that happens, Carrion Johnson value will go through the roof for me, or at least you know, a lot higher than what I have him at. Right now, his ADP has had him in the fourth and fifth round, and I've been very hesitant to want to rank him there, uh, to to want to even take him there in some of the mock drafts that I have been in because my major question mark is if you have C.J. Anderson for short yardage and you have Theo Riddick for third downs, carry on Johnson only gets what's in between, and that can be decent, but that would only be enough for a flex play. He's not going to score a lot, not going to catch a lot, What's it going to be, even though he's clearly the most talented back in that backfield? So if Theo Riddick were to actually get cut, that would be huge in securing the volume that Carrion Johnson could be able to see. Also, the Detroit Lions we're going to be getting into a little bit later. This last piece of news I kind of just wanted to throw in there because it's one of the few sure things that we have heard so far coming out of minicamp going into this, and that is Trey Quinn has locked down the slot position for the Washington Redskins. So I wanted to kind of throw that out there because the slot position of the Washington Redskins offense is a very important one. The middle of the field is typically where that offense likes to throw the football, no matter who's back at quarterback, no matter what's going on, because that's what Jay Gruden has built his scheme around. It's inside out. That's why Jordan Reed was figuring to be a target heavy target leader, if not the leading target person on that team. That's why Chris Thompson, if he's healthy, would still have some value uh, in PPR formats, especially because of the way Drew, Jay Gruden calls the plays for those dump downs. And it's also for the slot receiver. Look, we were, last year, Jameson Crowder was hurt quite a bit, but we remember two years ago where Jameson Crowder was a very, very high-end flex play, wide receiver, good solid wide receiver too to be able to have on your team no matter what the format was. Trey Quinn comes in. He was hurt a lot last season. He missed 13 games. He's coming into his second year, but they have been talking him up all mini camps, all OTAs of how good this kid has looked. So it is no surprise that he's come out already and said he has locked down that slot position. Part of it could be by default, but it's something you're going to want to keep your eye on. If you're in a standard redraft leagues, you're not going to draft Trey Quinn. I don't know if you even draft Trey Quinn in a PPR league, but he is somebody who that if he does not get taken in the back end of your draft, which he probably should not, he is somebody who I'm going to have at the very top of my waiver order list going into the season that I'm going to make sure I have my eye on in case I feel like I need to go pick up another receiver right away. All right, so that's the latest news from around the league. We're going to take a quick break right here, go into a live spot, and then after this, we're going to get right into the Cleveland Browns on the other side. 
Tired of spending hours upon hours on research for your drafts but still want the excitement of having something on the line while watching the game? Well, join the Thrive Fantasy app where they have streamlined the process for you to make it easy and fun to play along. Use promo code MDFF when you sign up with a $10 deposit and receive an additional $10 for free. Again, that's promo code MDFF. The Cleveland Browns. Yes, the Cleveland Browns are the darling, the sweetheart, the team that everybody wants to talk about here all going into this summer. It's them and the Cardinals that you're going to hear at a nauseatum pace that constantly is going to go through you. Look, Freddie Kitchens takes over as the head coach to be expected after they were not going to bring back Greg Williams for sure. And there's a lot that goes into that because the Cleveland Browns had a great second half of the season with Freddie Kitchen calling the plays as the offensive coordinator at the time. Baker Mayfield comes in for Tyrod Taylor, has one of the best rookie quarterback seasons ever. Ever. They add Odell Beckham Jr. They saw the emergence of Nick Chubb as a rookie. They have Kareem Hunt in case Nick Chubb gets hurt down later down in the stretch. Uh, you pairing when you're pairing up Beckham and Jarvis Landry, the old LSU teammates, you're going to have a great receiver combination there. David Njoku is developing. Uh, Antonio Callaway is nothing to sleep on as a third receiver in that offense who's just going to be there to take the top off and keep defenses honest from time to time. Everything sets up perfectly for Freddie Kitchens. Freddie Kitchens, he has a background of being under Bruce Arians. He was with the Cardinals from 2007 to 2017. Now, he was never an offensive coordinator with the Arizona Cardinals, but he was a tight ends coach. He was a running back coach. And he was a quarterback's coach before he became the offensive coordinator for the Cleveland Browns after Todd Haley was fired and then eventually became the head coach now once uh, Greg Williams is then moved out of the door. It's going to be a it's go, it's going to be very very similar to the old Bruce Arian system that he was running in Arizona at the time. It's going to be a lot of three receiver sets. It's going to be a lot of shotgun. It's going to be a lot of aggressive throws down the field. And now he's got the personnel to go out and make all of that happen as well. They're primarily going to use one running back. I know there's a lot of talk about them using Duke Johnson. That's why they don't want to trade him. Look, Duke Johnson. They want to hold on to Duke Johnson and say whatever they have to say to keep him you know, piped down a little bit at the very least because at the end of the day, with the depth chart that they have until Kareem Hunt comes back, they're going to want to keep Duke Johnson around as their second running back. Nick Chubb does have a history coming out of college with knee issues, so it's something you want to make sure you are protecting yourself from. So with Freddie Kitchens, this is one of those coaching changes where it it's not going to catch us totally by surprise. It's not a lot of just projecting of what he's going to do here because we got to see it for a half of the season last year. And I just think for a full season going into it, the it's it's just going to be that much better. They are already get to know they're young and they already get to know the system. They got to play in it a little bit last year. Now they're going to go into a full off season with the Freddie Kitchen system, which is built to put up fantasy points across the board. Getting a piece of this offense is a way that you're definitely going to want to go. The only guy I think I would probably back off from necessarily going out and getting you know, or wholeheartedly wanting to draft all the time would be David Njoku. Uh, coming from the Bruce Arians system, other than when Bruce Arians had, uh, I believe it was at the time, Kobe Fleener and Dwayne Allen, he had the tight ends over there with the Indianapolis Colts when he was the offensive coordinator there and coached as an interim head coach while Chuck Pagano was out with cancer. Other than then, typically has not used the tight ends. Now, I think we're going to see him use the tight ends while he's down in Tampa. But for the Freddie Kitchen's sake, they didn't throw it to the lot to the tight ends last year. You add Odell Beckham, it's only going to take more targets away. I like David Njoku. I think he's a very good red zone target to have. But he's going to be your, I would say, prototypical fantasy tight end where you're going to have to hope for a touchdown or a bust. I don't see him getting a lot of yards in between the 20s, even though there's going to be a lot of production to go around with this offense, how aggressive they're going to be, how many plays they're going to be off. Because while they might not be you know, the up-tempo style of what Cliff, uh, Cliff Kingsbury is going to be trying to run out in Arizona. They are going to get more plays off than I believe most teams will this season. They will be above average when it comes to that category. So that's something to kind of keep in mind when it comes to everybody else. But David Joku is maybe the one guy we want to mm, 
kind of want to see it before I believe it type of deal that you'll be able to still be able to eat with all these weapons around you the way this offense is built to go down the field on a consistent basis and use Nick Chubb out of the backfield as well. Remember, Jarvis Landry is going to kind of eat in there. Nick Chubb was going to pass catches in there. So just I would back off from David Njoku in this scheme, in this system a little bit. But overall, I would expect the Cleveland Browns offense to be one of the top five offenses with Freddie Kitchens as the head coach, as the main play caller. And if you had any any reservations whatsoever that they were going to be a pass-first team and an aggressive down-the-field pass-first type of team where they're going vertical most of the time, all of that got squashed when they brought in Todd Monken. All right? Todd Monken was the offensive coordinator from 2016 to 2018 with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And we all know what Tampa Bay has done under Dirk Cutter over the last couple of years. Throw, 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 throw down the field, throw all the time. So this is a team that definitely where you're, you're getting all this hype on Baker and on Odell Beckham and all these guys. It's for a good reason. The production is going to be there. Schematically wise, they are going to want to throw the ball first. That is what they're going to want to do. Now, Nick, having said that, you know, Kareem Hunt's not going to come back until the second half of the season. For now, Nick Chubb is going to be running backs. They do like to run it quite a bit. So it's it's not like Nick Chubb's suddenly going to get left behind because of the pass rush. So the opportunities will be there for Nick Chubb. I think the big thing you have to keep in mind when you're talking about Nick Chubb is back. But we're going to get more into that when we talk about uh, our analysis through different teams' depth charts a month. Well, not a month from now, but after this miniseries is over, we're going to start getting into that. And we'll get more into depth about each player on each team uh, right now just for the coaching changes in general this is definitely going to be an offense charge with kitchens and Mockins throwing the ball down the field now one of the hires that they still made that i was not a particular fan of was the fact that they hired steve wilkes to come in and be their defensive coordinator now i think it's good in some senses that steve wilkes comes in because i do believe that the cleveland browns needed to stay a 4-3 defense with the personnel that they had but at the same time, I'm not a big Steve Wilkes fan. Okay, now you can say, well, we'll go back to Carolina. It's Ron Rivera's defense. It's Ron Rivera's scheme. Steve Wilkes was a an idiot in Arizona, and that's why he got fired only after one season because he tried to turn a 3-4 team into a 4-3. Now he's coming into a situation where the 4-3 is already built in, but this is a 4-3 defense that's built to be aggressive. Steve Wilkes does not call an aggressive game. And he's a very, very conservative type coach. He's not an aggressive guy. Freddie Kitchens is in your face, balls to the wall every single day at practice. So is Todd Motkin. And this is where I thought firing Greg Williams was a mistake. Because I think having that mentality, that same philosophy on both the offense and the defensive side of the ball is something we just don't see enough of. And it, when we do, the few times we do get to see it, I think the last time I can really recall seeing a team that had that same type of aggressive mentality on both the offense and the defensive side of the ball was Sean Payton and Greg Williams on the New Orleans Saints when they won the Super Bowl against the Colts that year. I think that's the last time I've really seen it. Other than that, I haven't really seen it, and I think that really gets underrated and overlooked. When you have two philosophies meshing the way they do, you're going to push each other to get better. You got Steve Wilkes. He's he's going to come in. He's going to be like I said, he's going to be a little more conservative, a little more reserved in his personality. And I don't think that's what this defense needs. I think this defense needs to be as fired up as that offense to go after him. And more than that, I think they need to be aggressive in their play calling. Steve Wilkes is going to come in. We know it's going to happen. It's going to be all on the defensive line to generate the pass rush. He's not going to blitz a lot. It's not going to happen. He's going to play a lot of zone in the back end, which I think is also a mistake with the corners that they have. Denzel Ward's a man-to-man corner. Greedy Williams is a man-to-man corner. They are built to blitz with their linebackers and their safeties. This is not a team that's built to just do what Carolina did for years, which is rush four, drop seven, play read and react. This team is not there yet, not on that level. This is a young team. Young teams, generally speaking, do not do as well when they're pretty much their fundamental defense is read and react. They got to be told, you got to go hit this hole or you got to drop all the way back. 
don't read and react. Do one assignment or the other. I I don't like this hiring at all. I think Cleveland's defense, while talented, is actually going to underperform from a fantasy production and a production standpoint in general than people think they are going to be able to do. I love their talent. That defense is very talented. That's not what I'm saying. Steve Wilkes is the wrong guy for this job, and I think as a result, that defense is going to wind up underachieving, bringing more production from a fantasy standpoint on the offensive side. That's going to break down the Cleveland Brown. We're going to take another quick little break right here. On the other side, we're going to talk about the Lions and the Falcons on the other side. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is proud to become a new member of Overtime Heroics. Overtime Heroics is a fantastic sports media platform for sports fans all around the world to come and participate in their extensive forums. And now with the merger of the Land Sports Network, the website will soon have great content available from extremely well-written articles to entertaining and informative podcasts from all sports for you to enjoy. All you have to do is register for free at OvertimeHeroics.com to participate. Again, that's OvertimeHeroics.com. The Detroit Lions. You want to talk about a change in a coaching philosophy and an offensive philosophy than what we have seen. Look no further than Daryl Bevel taking over the Detroit Lions offensive coordinator job. I mean, you cannot get more night and day from Jim Bob Cooter to Daryl Bevel. No chance whatsoever. Look, if you're not familiar with Daryl Bevel's work, he hasn't been away from football that long. It's only been a year. From 2011 to 2017, he was the Seahawks offensive coordinator. Okay? We all know what Bevel wants to do. Bevel is a run first guy at heart, but he's coming into a situation where the offense is built around Matt Stafford. You have Kenny Galladay, who is a budding up and coming superstar. You have Marvin Jones, who's a very, very, very good complimentary wide receiver to have on the other side. You just drafted TJ Hawkinson, who is keeps getting nicknamed the new Gronk. I don't think he'll ever be quite that good, but he is a mismatch to be had in the passing game. And not to mention, when we look at the running back position, when we look at Carrion Johnson, one of his best attributes is his playmaking ability when he catches the ball in open field. That is one of the best things about him. So you have a team that is built for the pass. You also have a very, very questionable offensive line. Now he went through a lot of years in Seattle with a questionable offensive line with the exception of his early years. Because the early years, Seattle had a very, very good offensive line. But towards the later part of his offensive coordinating career there with the Seattle Seahawks, he did have to go through quite a few years where they had a mix and match. They even had defense line guys over there. So he has played behind bad offensive lines before, but you're coming into another situation where it's awful. And one that's probably one of the reasons why he got fired, because he got away from it. Now, here's here's this coaching situation where I see this quite often, where you bring in a guy because you want to balance out what you were not good at the year before. So you bring in a run-first guy who's known for being able to get your running attack going to a team that is was so pass heavy for the past couple of years is built to be a pass happy team and you want to try to balance it out and you think that'll help improve and in theory you're not wrong but here's the problem with especially with when it comes to find with older coaches who are calling the plays it's very very hard for them to adapt from what they want to do and if you make them do something that they aren't fully on board with or 100% comfortable with uh, or is not their expertise necessarily, it can cause every aspect of your game to struggle. For example, okay, the Seattle Seahawks went through a change after Marshawn Lynch left the first time. Well, after he left, they wanted to try to take it from being a run-first Seattle team and try to make it Russell Wilson's team, build the offense around Russell Wilson. So they tried to throw the ball more. Well, let's take 2017, the year Bevel wound up getting fired as a result. In 2017, they had the 15th best or you know, middle of the pack type of offense in 2017 when he tried to throw the ball on a more consistent basis and be more towards the middle as far as passing to running. Okay? 15th. 
They were just two years before that. They were fourth in total offense when he was sticking to his guns and doing his run first play calling. His run first scheme. Now, yes, that's when they had Marshawn Lynch, but they were a run first team, and yet they were fourth in total offense. Rushing and passing combined, they were fourth. So they're a very good offensive team when he stuck to what it was that he knew. Now, yes, the Seattle Seahawks were built very differently at that point. They had a power offensive line, still some remnants of some good players in 2015 on that offensive line. They still had Marshawn Lynch. They were still built to be in that way. They used Russell Wilson uh, for rushing purposes as well. So they were built for that. He's coming into a situation, though, that's what worries me with the Detroit Lions, where they're not built for that. They are built for the pass. What happens when Daryl Bevel tries to adapt to the players that he has. Normally that's a good thing unless you're just not that good of a play caller when it comes to that. If you try to if he tries to come in there and run more pass plays than he's used to or that he wants to implement his scheme, I worry a little bit that it's not going to go over well. He's not he's not a guy who schematically gets guys open. He doesn't go east to west. He doesn't he doesn't set guys in motion. He doesn't Get find a ways to get you know the Kenny Galladay's and the Marvin Joneses one on ones all the time. That's not what he does. It's not where his creativity comes from. His creativity is getting that run game going. Is finding that extra key pull block in a certain situation. Is finding south. That is what he comes in to do. That is what he wants to do. That is what he's comfortable with doing. So the question is going to be: Can Daryl Bevel balance out this Detroit offense that you think in theory might be the case? Or will it be his doom? Will it be the Lions' doom? Because it's simply not something... That is where I don't know. I don't know. And that's where that's where I am hesitant on all Detroit Lions. I don't think I'm going to be drafting Matthew Stafford in a 10 or 12 team year period. I don't think I'm going to. Because I don't know what to expect out of Bevel. I don't, if he comes in and is actually good at it and tries to run the ball first, well then... There's going to be a hell of a lot less opportunities out there. We know that he was still hurt a year ago. He apparently had a bad back injury uh, over it right now. So there's going to be less opportunities to throw. He didn't have a good season a year ago. You're bringing in an offensive coordinator who's not a pass-happy guy, who's not a pass-creativity guy. So it's not going to help Matthew Stafford in any kind of way. So I'm not going to be drafting Matthew Stafford. Kenny Galladay, borderline going around the same territory as an A.J. Green right around now in that fourth round, going ahead of guys like Allen Robbins. How many, I take all of them, all those guys I just listed, I would take all over Kenny Galladay because I have more faith in what I can expect out of them in their situations than I do out of Kenny. I love Kenny Galladay, the player. They're no doubt. Love, love Baby Tron. Love Baby Tron. The situation that they are about to walk into with Daryl Bevel taking over as the offensive coordinator, I don't trust that I know what to expect out of Kenny Galladay going into this season at the end of the day. And that's really what it boils down to. I don't trust what I can maybe get out of Marvin Jones as that complimentary guy at the end of the day either. I think they'll have good seasons. I think there's also a very good chance that neither one of them, that includes Kenny Galladay, goes over 1,000 yards. I think that's a very real possibility in this offensive scheme. So if he's not, not going to sniff 1,000 yards, he doesn't belong in the fourth round. I got news for you. And I don't think you can't make the argument to me that he will. Has Bevel had 1,000-yard receivers before? Yeah, he has. I'm not saying he can't. But what I'm telling you is that I don't feel super confident about it especially if they come in and try to be a run-first team. Does it boost the value of on Johnson? In theory. In theory. But as I talked about in the, in the opening of the show, when I was talking about the latest news, and I was talking about Theo Riddick being on the roster bubble, they need to clear out some guys because while they brought Bevel running backs and instead of just using guys for depth charts and backups, they want to give everybody a role, and they still brought just baffles my mind alone. So what are you going to have? C.J. Anderson? C.J. Anderson's more of a Bevel type. Now, I'm not saying that C.J. Anderson is going to steal the job from Carrion Johnson. It's not, it's not what I'm saying. All the goal line roll? Do you take away the touchdowns then from Carrion Johnson when you get inside the 10-yard line? Is it short down yardage? Is, that, is it a split? If Bevel runs the ball, it's conceivable that they would split. It's conceivable to keep him fresh. That's possible as well. Bevel wants to do, but because of the situation that he is coming into... He may feel like he can't go full bevel. He may feel like he can't go full run first. 
some that's it's really hard for them to adapt that way. It's really hard for them to get into a, their own rhythm and stay on top of what it is that they want to do. Like it's important for play callers to be in rhythm. As just as important as it is for quarterbacks to streak, for running backs to get in a hot streak and stay in a rhythm, it's just as important for play callers to be in rhythm. But I do worry about with Bevel. Now, if Theo already gets cut, like the reports are coming out and saying that he's on a roster bubble, I have no more concerns. Because I don't care what CJ Anderson's role winds up being. I don't care if he winds up being a, a red zone threat that's going to get his fair share of carries. And now you got the guy who's going to get the he's going to get all the passing down work on top of it. And I know what kind of playmaker he is when he's catching the ball out of the backfield. So to me, a big key with carry on would be does Theo Riddick get cut? And if Theo Riddick gets cut, then I have all the faith in the world that carry on Johnson will have a good season under Bevel. Everywhere else, I'm still going to have question marks about, but at least I'll know that I can expect great things out of carry on as long as he does not get injured in that situation. But just something food for thought. A lot of people, like I said, they're going to come in when they talk about Detroit Lions, when they talk about Daryl Bevel, they're going to they're gonna talk about, well, I can't, we love carry on. He's going to find a way to run the ball. He gets, great, he gets great success. He gets great stats out of his running backs all the time. I'm just warning you, when he tried to go from a run-first team to a more balanced pass built around the quarterback with the Seattle Seahawks, that offense took a major, major downfall. Going from fourth, going to the top five, to being in the middle of the pack. That's a huge gap that you just fell. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Just keep in mind, sometimes philosophy in certain situations really plays a big role in what a team can or cannot do. All right, let's get to our next team here. The Atlanta Falcons. The Falcons have a similar type of coaching change analysis that we get through from the Browns in the sense of we've seen this coaching change in action already before. Dirk Cutter was the offensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons for a while. In fact, this is the, the success that he had with the Atlanta Falcons as the offensive coordinator is the reason why he became the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Plain and simple. Now, here's something that I keep hearing about Dirk Cutter uh, from a lot of different people around the industry that I feel like really needs to get a clarification because it's just, it's simply not true at the end of the day. And that is that Dirk Cutter is a cancer for all running backs. Is he? Is he? Or is it the fact that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have not had a good running back in the time that Dirk Cutter was the head coach, which was which was from 2016 to 2018? Is it that Peyton Barber is not a good running back in the NFL? He's a backup, not a starter. He's not going to do anything for you other than fall forward for maybe three yards. That's all you're going to get out of Peyton Barber. That's what he is. I don't care who the head coach is. I don't care if it was Darryl Bevel who we talked about who's, who's known for running. I don't care if it was Kyle Shanahan whose system is known for getting running backs going. I, I don't care who you put back there. I don't, I don't care. I don't care if it's, it's Brian Schottenheimer. doesn't matter. Peyton Barber's not good, okay? And then I heard, you know, oh, the Falcons running backs had their worst years on our dirt cutter. No, they didn't. Not at all. Devontae Freeman had some of his best years under Dirk Cutter from a fantasy football production, which is what we're talking about here. So he's the, he's the offensive coordinator from 2012 to 2015 with the Atlanta Falcons. You want to know what Devontae Freeman did? 2015. Freeman was 10th in rushing yards per game. He had 11 touchdowns, 1,600 total yards I'm sorry, he had 1,600 total yards, 14 total touchdowns, 11 rushing touchdowns. That's a pretty damn good season. That was under Dirk Cutter. So this this whole idea that Dirk Cutter's a cancer for all running backs and that even if Devontae Freeman is able to come back healthy, even if he's able to get back his speed burst and show you what he used to be, even though Tevin Coleman is gone and Edo Smith is not the same type of running back and this could be more so Devontae Freeman's backfield than it has ever been, because Tevin Coleman is gone, that somehow Freeman will still not be able to make a comeback because Dirk Cutter's the office coordinator and he's cancer on, on, on running backs. I've heard this from a lot of experts in the industry, and I gotta tell you, I cannot disagree more because they're just totally ignoring one of Devontae Freeman's best seasons. Now, I think part of the reason is because the following year in 2016, he had one of his best efficient years, and he had a very, very good year, just as good of a year as he did the year before under Kyle Shanahan, and it was not just Freeman, but Tevin Coleman as well. 
Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. All I know is that Devontae Freeman was a top 10 RB1 running back when Dirk Cutter was the offensive coordinator in 2015. That's all I know. So I'm not worried about Devontae Freeman under Dirk Cutter. A, he already knows the system. B, Tevin Coleman's gone. Edo Smith is not nearly as good as Tevin Coleman. So if Devontae Freeman is actually going to get is not going to have to do this every other series thing that he was having to do with Tevin Coleman. If he's actually going to come in and get the passing down work, which he's definitely by far the best pass catcher compared to Ito Smith. And he's a much more efficient goal line runner. So if, if Ito Smith is just going to be there to spell Freeman every so often, and he is going to do that, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Ito Smith was one of those guys who's getting somewhere between 6 and 10 carries every game. You're going to come in, you're going to spell Freeman. This is still going to be a pass first offense. I understand all that. But if but the idea that Freeman can't have a good season under Cutter is erroneous as long as he's healthy. And if the reports that he is back to his back to up to snuff, back up to his speed that he used to be at, there's no reason to think that Devontae Freeman can't have a good season this year. Now, you want to make the argument that you don't think that he's going to be able to stay healthy the full season? I'm not going to argue with you because I don't think he's going to stay healthy the full season either. But while he's on the field, I do think he will be very productive. And I do think at worst, he'll be a very, very good RB2 while he is on the field and is healthy. I don't think he's going to go all the way. I think if you had Devontae Freeman, you better make sure you do handcuff him with Edo Smith. And as we get into you know later podcasts, getting closer to August, and I'll do more strategy talk, you're going to hear me say, I am not a fan of handcuffing. I am not a fan of wasting roster spots. But that is one situation where if you're going to pick up Devontae Freeman, you better pick up Edo Smith because the clock's ticking. So I, I will say that much. But as far as this coaching change goes, what the impact is on the running on a running back, since the most negative thing I've heard with Dirk Cutter, uh, Tampa Bay didn't have a good running back. Devontae Freeman has had good seasons under Dirk Cutter. All that notion should be thrown out the window. I don't really understand why he's getting brought up in that sense. We know he's going to be pass first. The Falcons are built to be pass first anyway. Matt Ryan, Julio, you can expect Calvin really to even improve in his second year. I think he'll take more of a prominent role more early. The second in targets when it comes to receivers over Muhammad Sanu. But even Sanu's not gonna even Sanu's gonna have a decent flex play to be able to have out there as well. This the biggest thing I keep hearing about the Falcons, and it's 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 very, very true, uh, and a, definitely a big deal, is the fact that they are only going to play three games outside of a dome this season. Just three. Just three. That means 13 games this year. Wonders that does for that offense in particular. That for Matt Ryan in particular. For Dirk Cutter in particular, who wanna play who wants to play fast. You're not gonna play to have to play in elements for 13 games at least. <sighs> Woo! Yeah, Matt Matt Ryan, Calvin Ridley, you could be sky's the limit as a wide receiver too. Everybody could eat. Everybody can eat. The only guy who I'm backing off of is Austin Hooper because I do not think he's going to get the same red zone looks that he did a season ago. And I don't think he's as good as his production from a year ago would suggest as well. So the only guy I'm kind of backing off a little bit is Austin Hooper. That's not really has to do with the coaching change situation, though. Dirk Cutter will throw it to his tight ends. And OJ Howard, Cameron Bray all got work. But the biggest thing with Dirk Cutter is remember is that while I didn't like him as a head coach, as an offensive coordinator, he does a good job of making sure his playmakers are able to get the ball and contribute on a regular basis. He's going to keep them in rhythm. He's going to be attacked down the field. And that's what this Falcons offense is definitely built to do, especially with that many games in the Dome. It's going to be very, very interesting to watch for sure. All right, we're, on the other side, we're going to wrap up with the Dallas Cowboys, and we're going to close out the podcast. The MD's Fantasy Football Show is now partnered with the Unwrapped Sports Network. Unwrapped Sports Network has a top-notch sports blog covering all sports all the time with a team of talented writers. You can also visit their podcast page to listen to this show and several others covering multiple sports. Sign up for their newsletter and never miss a thing at UnwrappedSports.com. Again, that's UnwrappedSports.com. The Dallas Cowboys. The Cowboys have to be one of the most mysterious coaching change teams to me that I had to examine and analyze as to what I thought was going to be the impact for them. And a lot of that has to do with, we don't know if it's going to be different or not. It's kind of the same mold as the Lions, but for a very different reason. We go from Scott Linehan here to Kellen Moore. Now, I part of me wants to make the argument that 
there's really nothing worse than Jason Garrett calling the plays or over the last couple of years, Scott Linehan even calling the plays because watching that Dallas Cowboy offense had to be one of the most putrid things to watch as far as a play calling standpoint. Uh, where it was just it's very it was very basic it was very simple it was run Elliot left or right screen Elliot and then pray someone gets open on third down. Now we got to see it open up a little bit when Amari Cooper came into play and also kind of showed you wonders of how much better Dak is how much better that Cowboys offense is in general is when you actually have a legitimate talent at the wide receiver position to be able to go to. I think, you know, Des Bryant got hurt, and then he had a really bad year the year after he got hurt. He just didn't look like himself. But it was how soon, how quick people forget how good that offense was, even though it was basic, even though it's just fundamentally, it was Des, it was Jason Witten, Dak, and Zeke in their rookie years, about built around a really good offensive line. That was it. That was your weapons. That was what you used and how effective that was. The play calling sucked. The play calling was as vanilla and as simple and as predictable as you could possibly get, but you couldn't stop it. You couldn't stop it because the offensive line was so good. You couldn't stop it because it was just enough to constantly get the job done, to constantly keep the defense on their toes and unable to stop it, even if they knew what was coming. Just having that wide receiver, that's how good they were with a healthy Des Bryant pre-injury and a even though an aging Jason Witten but a serviceable Jason Witten with Dak and Zeke you kind of got to be reminded of that a season ago they brought Amari Cooper all of a sudden you have a legitimate wide receiver all of a sudden that offense that offense is actually looking nearly like a juggernaut the play calling still wasn't great but they were able to be aggressive they were able to take guys out of the box for Zeke they were all of a sudden able to do play action. Dak all of a sudden looked a lot better because he gets that extra half a second to make a read off of play action when it's effective. Not just to make a read where to throw, but make a read whether he wants to run and be more effective in that way. Be a playmaker, which is what he needs to be in certain of those situations. So it all fell into place. I would argue that they could take another step up if they just had any any ounce of creativity whatsoever when it came to offensive play calling. And maybe that's where Kellen Moore comes in. He come. He, this guy was a great college quarterback in a Boise State system, so he knows he knows some college, college schemes. He knows motion offense. He knows how to get guys one-on-ones. That's what that whole offense was, was built around. That offense was built around getting guys one-on-ones. So he knows how to do that. He's... He was the backup quarterback for Dak. He has a familiarity with the Dallas Cowboys. But that also could be his biggest downfall. And that's where I say it's a mystery. Because, you, yeah, he has a familiarity with the Cowboys. Does that mean that majority of his offense is going to have the Jason Garrett concepts that we have all come to want to shoot our brains out when we have to watch on Sunday? As far as, Like I said, as far from a play-calling standpoint. Because the offense still finds a way to be effective because that, the talent they have at the running back and offensive line positions, and Dak being a good quarterback, and, and Amari Cooper now, they have enough talent where they overcome that. And they just play fundamental offense. But, whew, it's boring. It's like, it's like watching 1995 out there. Can Kellen Moore come in? Can he change that? Or is he just going to have some of those same concepts? Is he going to want to have the mentality that the Dallas Cowboys have, have had since Jason Gary has been the head coach, which is don't do anything to lose the game? We're not going to be aggressive enough to go out there and dictate and dictate our style, dictate to the other team that we are going to win the game, we're going to win the game this way, but we are going to make sure we don't lose the game. Is that what he's going to adapt we don't know. We haven't seen Kellen Moore call plays. But here's what I do know. He's a younger guy who in college spent a pretty creative offense. He understands football really well. And you have good fundamental pieces. Jason Witten's back. I don't know what Jason Witten has left in the tank. And 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 frankly, as far as from a fantasy perspective, you shouldn't be drafting Jason Witten. You, you got to see what this guy actually has on the field before he even pops up on your radar as a waiver wire pickup. I mean, I mean let's keep this real here. For all those Jason Witten lovers out there. But still have Zeke, still have Zach, Dak. You got Amari right now for a full season, who looked like he showed a rapport right away with with just just a couple couple of nuances. 
would really would be all it would take to make that offense look like night and day, to open things up that weren't open there. A little, a little play action bootleg every once in a while with Dak. A little, a, just a couple of different nuances is all it would take for that offense to take a next step. From the off, to churn out first down after first down after first down with a couple of big plays to Cooper, a couple of big plays to Witten, a couple of big plays to Michael Gallup. Instead, open it up. Get that eighth man out of the box for Zeke. Could you imagine what Zeke could do if he saw six-man fronts, seven-man fronts the majority of the time? Incredible when he sees eight- and nine-man fronts. What could he do if you take that extra defender or two out? That's where I want to see from Kellen Moore as a play caller. Is he going to bring some creativity? Is he going to bring, frankly, anything different than what we have seen out of the Dallas since Jason Gary has been the head coach? Because Scott Linehan was different. Uh, you guys got to remember, Scott Linehan was the offensive coordinator for the Detroit Lions before Jim Bob Cooter when they were throwing the ball all over the place. He did too, but two opposite ends of the Sean Payton tree. He came from the aggressive, early Drew Brees year Sean Payton system. That's what he brought to him when he was coaching when he was coaching the Detroit Lions. He was throwing that kind of offense out there, throwing it out, going east and west, getting one-on-ones, pass-first type of team. That's what Scott Linehan was before he came to the Dallas Cowboys. I feel like people forget that. But he came to the Dallas Cowboys, he goes under Jason Garrett, and all of a sudden, we see nothing of the old Scott Linehan offense at all. So that's where I'm curious. At the the end of the day, is it Jason Garrett saying, rein it in, only doing these things, keeping the playbook simple? Is, Is that coming from him? He's not calling the plays, but it seems like no matter what offense coordinator they brought in there, no matter what their history has shown us, they seem to revert to what Jason Garrett does and what we've known him to do, which is pretty much basic 1998 Madden offensive play calling. as basically what it is at the end of the day. So that's going to be the question going into this season. I don't know when we're going to see it. You're not going to see it in training camp. You're not going to see a full book, a full playbook out of anybody in training camp. But what I what I will be looking for in the preseason games when I'm watching Dallas Cowboys, I'm, go, I'm going to be looking for little nuances. Does he call a couple motions here and there? Is a little jet sweep play action, a little RPO action? Does he have different nuances that he's going to be introducing to the playbook in preseason? I, I am going to be looking for that. But we're really not going to know until the regular season. But here, here's what I will say. With the Cowboys, there's, there's some comfort in knowing that there's some definites in what you're going to get. You know Amari Cooper is going to get peppered as the number one target. You know Zeke is going to be Zeke. And... The, the great thing with Zeke right now is that no matter what Kellen Moore does as a play caller, his prospects in, instantly, immediately look better than they did a season ago because Travis Frederick's going to be back. Tyrone Smith is back from injury. Zach Martin's not as banged up. They're going in with their healthy offensive line that they really haven't had together. I, don't, I feel like people don't realize this, but they haven't had these guys together all not injured and healthy at the same time since, since Zeke's rookie year. And now they're all back now. So that, in and of itself, will help Zeke even more and possibly even be more more productive than he was last year. More court towards his rookie year as far as efficiency goes. Just with, you know, the numbers of last year because he got to actually play the entire season. It wasn't, it wasn't worked in for the first couple of weeks. Or it didn't take the first couple of weeks to work him in, I should say. So... We know we're going to get the Cowboys. You you know Dak is going to be a streaming quarterback option. You know Omari Cooper is going to get the amount of targets he needs and be featured in a way that's going to live up to what Omari Cooper's talent actually is and making him a low-end wide receiver one. We know Zeke is a top two running back in fantasy football, period. So the question is just going to be how high can their ceilings be will be the very dependent on what kind of play caller Kellen Moore is going to turn out to be? Unfortunately, that's a question I don't think anybody can actually give you an accurate answer to until the season starts. It's unfortunate. I, I did as much digging as I could. I, I did as much examining as I could because when I do when I do these podcasts, I want to give you I want to give you a, a, an answer. I, if I can give you a de- definite answer, I want to give you a definite answer. But I at least want to give you uh, some kind of inclination of one way to lean one way or another. All I can say is that anything is better than Jason Garrett calling plays and that Kellen Moore being a younger guy might bring a newer generation of play calling with him, which I think would be nothing but beneficial for the Dallas Cowboys. But 
it's really just theoretical because we don't have anything to really base it off of because not only is this his first job as an NFL coach, but this is his first job as a coach, really, period. He's been around as an assistant quarterback's coach. He was the backup for Dak, kind of. You know, I mean, kind of as an assistant coach, he's been the backup for Dak, and he's kind of coming in. He's already like his first coaching, of course, real coaching job is going to be offensive coordinator. So we don't have anything to actually base this on from that standpoint. But like I said, at the end of the day, you know what players you want, you know at least what you're going to get, and you can have the hope that Kellen Moore is going to bring a new generation type of thinking to the play calling for the offense of the Dallas Cowboys. That's going to wrap up this show. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. Remember, make sure you are following me at MDFF Show on Twitter and on Facebook to get the, first of all, the player update news notifications that are coming through. I'm going to let you know who's who, you know who's looking good, where the reports are coming out of camp. If you do that on Twitter, make sure you have your notifications turned on so you're getting everything I have. But also for any announcements, because I will be announcing in the next couple of days exactly when the MD Sandy Football Show will be going live for the first time on OvertimeHeroics.com. So make sure you are following along to know when that's going to be because that will be the coaching changes Fantasy Impact Part 4, that will be the last installment of this mini-series that we have before we move on to our next topics coming up in the next few weeks uh, as we get through July and get closer and closer to August. Make sure you check out OvertimeHeroics.com and also make sure you check out the new Unwrapped Sports network.com that we are proud to have partnered with officially with this podcast today. I hope you guys all enjoy the show. I will see you again next time. Thank you for listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show.